Okay, so now we're going to look at the final two tools that you could use for measuring capital investments. We already covered payback period. We covered uh, ARR, the accounting rate of return. Those did not take into consideration the time value money. The next two do. The next two, in fact, do take it into consideration. You have the NPV, the net present value, and IRR. Those two take into consideration what we just learned or reviewed, the present value, time value of money. All right, NPV, the example here, Allegra is considering two potential investments. Both cost $1 million. They have a five-year expected life and no residual value. The predicted net cash inflows are smartphones listed there, so 305,450 every year for a total of five years. So the total cash inflow is 1,527,250. Speakers not set, set every period, They're, they fluctuate, but we have a total of $1,440,000. We're gonna try to compare these two and say, which option has the highest NPV? Both cost a million dollars, both cost a million dollars, but they have different cash flows. We'll take a look and see which one between these two options actually turns out from a financial perspective to be the better option. Okay, so when we have NPV with equal annual net cash inflows, this is an annuity. This one's the easy one. We're gonna take uh, the $305,450, that was the cash inflow. We'll, we'll go back, see that 305, 450, that was the previous slide. That's the same every year. So now that we have an annuity, we know we can use the PV, the present value of an annuity. The table is table B, and we'll look at the interest rate of 14%. I don't know, did they give us that? They didn't give it that here, but that would actually that would have to be given in the problem. I equals 14% and N equals five. That we could figure because there was five years here, right? Okay. So we'll use 14% with N equals five, and we'll run through that table. Uh, over the top is the I, over the uh, column on the left is the N. We'll find the intersection of those two, and we'll come up with the, using table B, we'll come up with a factor of 3.433, 3.433. That factor multiplied by the payment or the annuity of 30554 by zero, 305450, gives us a total of 1,048,610. So this is the present value of all those cash flows. We're gonna, we, we chalk that up. We've got $1,048,610, but that's just the present value. When we want the net present value, we're gonna subtract the initial investment. So 1,048,610 minus the initial investment of $1,000,000 gives us a net present value of 48,610. Boom, we have that number we have. Now we can compare that to the second alternative. Well, even before we do that, it says the decision rule is if the net present value is positive, then it's a go. But that would only be if you were just reviewing one alternative, one alternative. If the net present value comes up to be negative, if you and that can happen, in fact, in, in a lot of cases, it's gonna happen. Your initial investment is gonna be larger than what the net present value is of those future cash flows. If that occurs, then you will end up with a negative value. And if you have a negative value, then the answer is no, it's a no-go. We can't move forward with it, okay? Do not invest. That would be the criteria if you're just looking at one. In, in our case, though, we're actually looking at two investments, right? The first one was, we've already come up with the, the present value. Now, we're going to look at the unequal annual cash flows. This one's going to be a little bit tougher because now we're going to have to use every single cash flow. We're going to have to find out what the present value is of each cash flow. 500000 350000 300,000, 250,000, 40,000, each one of them, and we're gonna use the present value of a single sum. See, this isn't, this isn't an equal amount every year like the previous example. 
the values are changing. So we're going to have to do five different computations, five different computations. And we're really finding out for each one, it's the single lump sum of each one of those. Okay. That's why we'll use the present value of a dollar table. That's the table A. All right. We know that 14% is involved. That's the rate. We're going to use the same rate to compare it to the previous example. And then we have n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and n equals 5. All right? So each one of these cash flows, 500, 350, we're going to have to set those up, and we're going to have to come up with the present value factor for each one of these using the table. It's only n equals 1 at 14%. You're going to come up with 0.877. If n equals 2 for the second year, the factor at 14%, it's going to be 0.769. The same table, by the way, it's all lump sums. Each one of these represent a lump sum because it's a different amount. So year 3, it's 0.675. Year 4, 0.592. Year 5 is 0.519. You can see that on the table. Make sure you're using the right table. And you're going to multiply the factors by the cash flow for each one of those years. In year 1, it's 500,000. Year two, it's 350,000. Year three, it's 300,000. So you know that that flows through. And you're going to multiply these net cash flows, multiply by the corresponding factor, 0.877 for the first year, 0.769 for the second year, et cetera. Do the, pro the, the multiplication. When you do the multiplication, you'll end up for the, with the present value of each one of these cash flows, each one of these cash flows. So that at the, at the very end, you can add up the present value of each cash flow. And then you'll end up with the present value of $1,078,910. That's the present value of all these cash flows. We're going to subtract the initial investment, $1 million. And we'll end up with the NPV, the NPV of $78,910. Now, if this was an only, if this was an investment that you were simply looking at by itself, is this a go or no go? And the answer is, it's a go because it ended up with a positive NPV, positive NPV. However, if you're looking at it in the context of whether this investment or the other alternative we looked at, the other alternative ended up with uh, 40, what was it, 40, 48,610. So intuitively, I wanna say obviously, let's say intuitively you would compare the 48,610 to the 78,910, and between these two alternatives, this one would actually be the, the best financial alternative, purely financial perspective, right? Purely financial. Now, another one that we're gonna take into consideration, I told you there was only two, but there's one called the profitability index. We're gonna stick this in between the two that we talked about. The profitability index helps to choose among alternatives. The profitability index says, let's take the present value of the net cash inflows and divide it by the initial investment. So I told you earlier, if you're looking at two alternatives, you're going to go with the highest of the net present value, which is true. But you probably want to take this into consideration as well. What is the initial investment? And let's compare that in terms of the profitability index. Which ones actually return the greatest amount of money based upon the in initial investment? So this computes the number of dollars returned for every dollar invested. All calculations performed in a present value dollars. So profitability index example, the present value of net cash inflows of project A and project B and project C. Let's say we did the calculation. We're going to ignore those first two that we already done. Let's say we have three different new projects and the, and the NPVs have been computed to be 25,000, 38,000, and 32,000. Present value of the cash flows less the initial investment gives us those dollar amounts. So now that we have the NPV for all the projects, now what we're going to do is we're going to take the initial investment, which like for project A, it's 125,000. And we're going to take that and uh, divide it into the present value of the cash flows. So 150, 150,000 divided by 125,000, 150 divided by 125, 150 divided by 125 gives us a profitability index of 1.2. In the second project B, it's 238,000 divided by 200,000. In this case, it's 1.19. In the third case, it's 182, 182, that's Project C, divided by the initial investment of 150, 150,000, and that's going to give us a profitability index of 1.21. When we take into consideration the initial investment, especially if they vary, if they are different, then at that point in time, the profitability index is going to be the best tool to be using in order to decide 
which is the best one we should move forward with. In this example here of the three profitability indexes, the one that we really like is C because it has the highest profitability index. Now let's look at the NPV of a project with residual value, okay? So what we're gonna do is discount the residual value to its PV when determining the total PV of the project's net cash inflows. And then we have to uh, discount it as a single lump sum. So let's go to a specific example so that it makes a little bit more sense to us. Suppose Allegra expects the smartphone project equipment to be worth $100,000 at the end of its useful life. What is the NPV of the project now? Well, this is the first one where it had steady stream of equal payments. We can make our lives easier because those first five years is going to give us uh, um, an annuity, and therefore we can use the annuity factor of 14% for five years, I14 in five. We'll get the present value factor of 3.433 times the net cash flow of 305,450. So that gives us the present value. We actually already did this. We did this previously, but the difference now is now there's a residual value that we're going to get when we sell this. And the example gave us that it's going to be 100,000. We could sell this asset for $100,000. Now that cash flow is not equal to the previous cash flow. So we can't treat it as an annuity. We have to break that one out separately and treat it as a present value of a dollar, a, lingual, a single lump sum. So we'll look up on our tables for five years, n equals five, i equals 14, present value of a dollar. This is the present value, of, not an annuity, but a present value of a lump sum. So that factor ends up being 14% at five is 0.519. We're gonna take that and multiply it against the $100,000 future value. And that gives us a present value of 51,900. Now we're gonna add these two up. Now the total present value is actually $1,100,510. We'll take out the initial investment, just like we had done before, and we'll end up with the NPV of 100,510. The only difference now between what we did the first time and this is we have this, this residual value at the end of the fifth year. And like I mentioned to you earlier, we have to treat that residual value as if, as if it is a lump sum, which it is a lump sum. It's one, it's one lump sum that's going to end at the end of the uh, period. Okay, so the last tool we're going to look at is called the IRR. And the IRR is referred to as the rate of return that a company can expect to earn by investing in the project. The IRR technically stands for internal rate of return. The project's internal rate of return. What is that internal rate of return? It is based on discounted cash flows again, and the interest rate that makes the NPV of the investment equal to zero. Now, this is kind of interesting, but the internal rate of return is what the investment is being generated for this project. Um, we're going to compare that to our what is referred to as the required rate of return, which that'll be another interest rate that's provided. Everything that we were looking at before is really looking at what are we required, what do we want out of this return. The IRR is really about what it what it's actually generating. Okay, so the interest rate that makes the cost of the investment equal the present value of the investment net cash inflows. So in other words. Whatever IRR, when, when, the IR, when the present value ends up being zero, then we know whatever that IRR is, that's the actual return on that investment. That's the IRR. The higher the IRR, the more desirable the project. The way we're going to compute the IRR is we're going to take the initial investment and we're going to divide that by the amount of each net cash inflow. Now, if we do that initial investment and we divide that by the amount of each net cash inflow, what we're going to get is a present value factor. And we're kind of going to go backwards into computing what this really is. Once we have that annuity present, fa present value factor, we're going to calculate the annual annuity PV factor, which is what we just did. This is th that's step number one. We just did that annuity PV factor. We just computed it. We're going to use the present value of an annuity table, at $1 table. We're going to go to that table. We're going to go to the row that correspond with the useful life. How many years is this going to be? One, two, three, five, ten years. And then we're going to flow down. Once we've got that row, we're going to go all the way down that row until we come up with the closest number to the annuity factor. And once we have that factor, we're going to move up and we're going to figure out what the interest rate is. What is the internal rate of return? 
Okay, so recall Allegra's smartphone project costs $1 million, $1 million with five equal cash inflows of 305,450. So we'll take the 305,450, we're gonna divide that into the $1 million. So 1 million divided by 305,450, gives us the factor that we're looking for. We're going to use the numbers that we have. We're going to come up with a factor. It's 3.274. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the present value of an annuity table for five years, for five years, and find this factor. So five years, and we're looking for 3.274. Five years, 3.274. Let's keep going. It's the fifth year. 3.27. Ah. 3.2743. Okay, so there's the factor. We found it. Now we're going to go up and boom, we have 16%. So this, this project here can give us the internal return, rate of return on the project by using the table of 16%. Okay, the other way we can do this is by using the calculations using uh, different interest rates. And this is almost trial by error. When we have unequal, unequal cash flows, we're going to have to do this trial by error. So what we're going to end up doing is first using 16% and we're going to do all these computations, NPV calculations, net cash using 16%. This is a trial. We're going to try the 16% and see what we're trying to do is come up as close as possible to zero and that'll tell us what the rate is. We'll, we'll try 16%. So we'll take all the cash flows, all the cash flows from year one and we're going to discount them by 16%. Remember when we have unequal cash flows, we can't use an annuity we have to use the present value of a dollar. So we have uneven cash flows. Each one of the cash flows, 500, 350, 300 has to be discounted to the present value. Using 16%, the first year, we look that up 16% for one year, I equals, or N equals one, 16, I equals 16, we have 0.862. We actually did this, I think, I don't know if we did this with 16%, but we, we did this earlier, I think. So we ended up with 431,000 pre net present value of the first cash flow and we do it again and again and again for five years, we're gonna add all of these up, we're gonna subtract, we're gonna subtract the initial investment, and we end up with $40,390, okay? So this was at 16%, I think that's, we might have used 16, I think, I think we did it earlier, it doesn't really matter. At 16%, we, we end up with a net present value of 40,000. But remember, the objective here is to try to figure out exactly what rate or something really close, of what, what is the internal rate of return? Well, if we're getting a positive cash flow, we know that we're getting something better than 16%. If it were exactly 16%, it would be zero. Okay, if it's exactly 16%, the net present value would be zero. So we know since we get a net present value of $40,390, we know that it's better than 16%. Let's try 18%. Guess what? We have to do the whole thing all over again and recompute it, but instead of using the, the present value factor of 16%, we're going to use the present value factor of 18%. So we're going to use those factors, we're going to multiply them by the net cash flow, and we're going to come up with the net present values of each cash flow. At this point in time, the net pre or the, the present value of these lump, these cash flows is 1,003,980. The, the investment is 1 million, its net present value is $3,980. This is really close to zero. So we know that it's 18, just a hair above 18%, 18 point something, 0.1, maybe 0 0.05 or something. We're, we're saying that this is close enough, that this, this IRR, the IRR for this investment is about 18%. Yeah, and just like the next slide shows, this is a trial and error process. We, I don't know if we really need, if we need to be more precise than that, then we're going to have to try, uh, you can't do that with tables because most times you won't find any tables. The next one would be 18.5%. The tables would work. You'd actually have to do calculators or formulas to figure this out. And once you have the calculators, it's pretty easy. Okay, so let's compare all of the different capital budgeting methods. Uh, the first two payback period in the ARR, you can see, and in fact, I'm going to let you read through these. But the one message that we have for these two, the payback period and the ARR for sure, is that they ignore the time value money. Which from a finance perspective, that's a pretty important thing. So um, we wanna make sure that we're taking into consideration the time value of money 
in most cases. You can use these as maybe a screener. You know, you're going to throw these out, these uh, budgeting options out because of, you know, because they don't meet a specific criteria. But uh, after they pass one of these two or both of these two, then you would go on to the next ones, to the NPV and the IRR. And those would probably be used as the real basis for making a decision, okay? Read through those. It's just text. I could read it to you, but that just takes time that we don't need to, to waste. Just read through it, and that'll give you everything you need to know. Okay, that concludes Chapter 12.